<laughs> Hopefully so. Hello and welcome to the First Church of Permaculture. Thank you, Robin and Christina. <laughs> We're going to try this again. Hopefully it's all working now. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to the First Church of Permaculture. And oh, come to the First Church of Permaculture. Oh, come to that grove in the wild wood. Oh, come to that grove in the bay. No place is so dear to my childhood as that old sacred grove in the vale. There's an old sacred grove in the wild wood, no lovelier place in the vale. No place is so dear to my childhood as that old sacred grove in the vale. Oh, come, 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 come. Oh, come to that grove in the wild wood. Oh, come to that grove in the vale. So dear to my childhood as that old secret grove in the vale. How sweet on a bright Sabbath morning to listen to that old Sabbath bell. As its tones sweetly call us to wander, oh, come to that grove in the vale. Oh, come, 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 come. Oh, come to the First Church of Permaculture. Hello. Thank you for joining. <laughs> oh, today we're going to be hopefully talking about about now oh, let's see how i do this oh good good morning from alaska thank you for joining now today we're going to hopefully be talking a little bit about the book growing free that we just launched only um it appears we've had some uh some technical issues with some people joining us so i hope that uh, jenny will still be able to to join us here but it looks like otherwise it may just be me and you folks who uh, who joined here who want to chat about the book a little bit. And I have a couple of free giveaways and some things to do uh, uh, together, too. So um, it was going to be uh, I can make this sort of announcement here this is going to be kind of a cool, cool thing. So with this book, Growing Free, which is adventures and patterns for building a more free and financially resilient life. Um, and we're going to be doing some different versions of it because we realized as we were writing the book that it's really a blueprint for rebuilding local economies and communities, community economies too. And so one of the projects that we're working on right now is a set of patterns as an add-on for community activists who want to like rebuild small town economies, you know, places where the local economies have been completely destroyed by Tyson and Dollar General, right? <laughs> where like the only economy that's happening is the dollar store and, uh, and you know, uh, 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 whatever kinds of uh, farming activities are being promoted by Tyson. So it's really common in a lot of small communities across uh, uh, North America. So that's a project that we're, we're going to have coming out this spring. And there was another project that we were going to kind of announce and do a small giveaway of today, which is a, um, which is a set of patterns and an add-on specifically to build a little more content for people who want to build, do like homesteading livelihoods and uh, want to live the, the sort of homesteading dream. And I'm using that, I'm starting with that word, um, 
homesteading here because it's the one that most people are most familiar with. And so I like that to, to do something that's going to be familiar to people. Uh, but now that I mentioned that word, uh, I will also add there are a number of people who consider that word to be kind of uh, to have some racist baggage since uh, the United States government used the homesteading policy to essentially seize land from native people and uh, and give it to uh, give it to uh, uh, white settlers or colonizers. So some people find that, you know, I understand why if uh, if your family was kicked off of their land by homesteaders, you might not like the word homesteading. So I tend to try to avoid it um, just for the future future reference. Uh, but the uh, so we're we're doing a whole separate book called um, called Living Free, which will have some excerpts from Growing Free and uh, or the Living the Free Life, I think is going to be the the title of it. And it's specifically for people who want to do regenerative agriculture, farming, um, and uh, small holding type livelihoods. But it's going to have to wait a couple of weeks because I had a technology disaster. Just yesterday, <laughs> the book was completely finished and uh, Apple did a forced uh, uh, software upgrade and, um, and I had some problems with my device after that. And so I was talking to the people uh, on my, my brand new Apple device at, uh, uh, at, uh, at Apple, their service, and they wa helpfully walked me through the, um, the, the, a process that erased all of my documents off of my computer. So that was very helpful. <laughs> they told me, they said not to worry. They're all there forever on iCloud because I had it backed up on two different devices. They're the rule of three, right? So I had it backed up on two different devices and on, on the cloud, on iCloud. And it was actually the connection to iCloud that ended up uh, uh, auto-syncing to my devices and erasing it off of both of my devices. So apparently they tell me it's still there on iCloud somewhere, but uh, thankfully due to their good privacy policies, they shall never be accessed by anyone ever again. So there's an eternal book out there that no one shall ever read. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to redo it. I'm going to redo it and we'll have that available. And so I have a different kind of giveaway today. So, hey, Jenny, thanks for joining. I think so. I think I see like seven people joining from Facebook Live right now, too. So I think we're up on Facebook Live and um, <laughs> and here. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and I'm actually having a little bit of a problem uh, with the sound with you, Jenny. Give me just a second. Um, you know, uh, all this technology is supposed to make life easier, right? <laughs> So, Jenny, I think um, it's going to turn out to just be you and me today, which is fun. It'll be the second time we've joined um, as first, you know, on one of these first church permaculture events. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So. While she does that, I'd like to just um, uh, mention again. So today we're going to be talking about the book Growing Free. And the free in it stands for financially resilient and economically empowered. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the FIRE movement. Uh, it was kind of started by, uh, by uh, an author who's become uh, one of my friends now, Vicki Robin. And she's, uh, it's one of my absolute favorite books. And it's, uh, it's, what's so fantastic about it is it's a book about money and personal finance, but it's really an activist book. It's really an anti-consumption activism book. And it's been one of the major inspirations in my life. 
And I keep finding when I talk to permaculturists, there's this huge community out there of people who have uh, who are also doing this FIRE kind of approach to life. You know, FIRE stands for financial independence, retire early is kind of the goal. And so the idea of it was we want to get people to be consumers less, you know, to consume less. And the carrot for that is early retirement. Uh, so it was the idea. And there, what I kept finding is I would teach PDCs and there were people who were financially independent and they were coming to permaculture because they now had the freedom to, to pursue things like regenerative agriculture and, and permaculture. But I don't know. Uh, but one of the things that kind of ended up bothering me and, and, and some other folks, like I, I believe Jenny, um, was this whole idea of retiring early, in a sense. And the fact that a lot of people in the fire movement end up like sacrificing the present now or maybe going to work for corporations and companies that they really don't support their work and they, and they aren't in harmony with their values. And they do those things for this dream so that someday in the future they can finally live a permaculture lifestyle. Jenny, what do you think about that? That's a good summation of, of the gist of why we got called, got called to do this, huh? Because, yeah, I would co-teach permaculture classes and participate in a lot of classes. And the students would, like, be all excited and dressed up. And then they'd go back home. Well, for one thing, they were re-colliding um, with the dominant residing within our own selves that we have to grapple with. And so I feel like um, our journey, um, realizing the importance of finance and economics and how it's not... Once we were able to do that, it, it, it feels like a missing puzzle piece, doesn't it? It yeah, it sure does. Hey, and I uh, I'm noticing that I think that uh, the folks on Facebook Live maybe have not been hearing you. So I think uh, somebody out there uh, who's on, if you could uh, give me a comment to let me know whether or not you can hear uh, hear Jenny now. I think I have uh, fixed the problem. We'll see. <laughs> testing, testing. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. All right. I, I hope so. <laughs> or should I try to get on the Facebook Live? I just couldn't see what to click on to join it on Facebook Live. Oh, you're you're fine. This is good because we I want it on both. And, and it sounds like, yeah. So now now we can hear you. Okay. So everything is good. Yay. All right. Cool. Yeah. So. Um, so. Yeah, that's a, a, a really interesting thing that there are so many people who feel like they want to be living a permaculture life and they have these goals they want to do. And they're always thinking they have to do it in the future somehow, you know. And whereas I think with us, when we started talking about it, what we found is we really respected the people who were figuring out ways with whatever their situation is. And we know that a lot of people don't have, uh, you know, the relative privilege to make it easy. And yet there are a lot of people out there who are figuring out their permaculture life and their path and connecting with it. And it's a, it's a process. It's a process of transformation process. from where you're at now to where you want to be. But there are actually people out there doing it. And, uh, and to me, they're doing some of the most inspiring stuff uh, in the world today. Yeah. Well, and also that's to build on what you were saying, like a lot of people were thinking, oh, we can't really, we have to, it's something for the future. It's something for later. Not only do we not have to think it's something for later? We can't afford to. There's so many people who want to do good work right now. And there's some very simple um, concepts that all of us arrived at together, some kind of core concepts that are easy to implement that makes it feasible to do it now. Because, you know, somebody who wants to, oh, I want to start um, a horse therapy business when I'm old and retired, no, we need that right now. There's all these people with PTSD or, or I'm an urban person. I'll try to try, I'll try to figure out urban permaculture later on. 
Now, now urban permaculture needs to be figured out now because there's a lot of us that would perish if we had to live out in the country by ourselves. And, <laughs> or, or there's all, there's all these people that don't, that we get indoctrinated by our own culture. Like, Oh, the, the pioneer myth, like it lives in our heads. Like, well, we're going to go out on 40 acres and we're going to live our dream. And like, no, a, there's not enough land for everybody to have 40 acres. B we owe land back. We owe it back. We do not each get to be taken up 40 acres. None of us can afford, most of us can't afford to buy 40 acres or 10 acres or whatever. So, yeah, so this book, it started to feel to me like this book's really urgent to like spring us out of the prison of the dominant um, economic myth <laughs> that's even, even highly persistent in the permaculture community because <laughs> we're colonized too. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. It's it's um it's funny how much we tend to think of permaculture. It was kind of in a way invented as a response, as, as like anti-colonization. You know, it really was. Bill Molson in in the, the the early days of permaculture, he was really looking at the tools of colonialism, including some of the the economic tools we talk about in this book. Things like you know, Adam Smith said you know, in, uh, in um, A Wealth of Nations, he points out that corporations were kind of created as colonial instruments of warfare. You know, they were non, non violent warfare. You know, well, they were not violent, just That's not militarized. Violent. It's, violent. it's not obvious blood pouring out. Right. It's hey, so Mike, I have a question. <laughs> I, I have a question. Are we able to take? Um, or hear comments from our audience? Is this a two-way channel here? How does it work? It is. Robin and Christina are welcome to ask questions on Zoom. And we've got several people joining on Facebook and they can, uh, they can add, um, they can type in uh, questions. Please ask any questions and we'll, we'll, um, we'll try to address some of them. And in fact, there was a little bit of an issue with hearing you and we're, I'm told, I'm reading that it's improved and that now uh, Jenny's louder and that helps. Okay. So we're getting some feedback. Yeah. And so uh, in a minute, I will actually, so Robin and Christina and everybody out there on Facebook, uh, feel free to ask a or think of any questions about this idea. Um, and, oh, Jenny's disappeared. <laughs> I was I was seeing if my jacket, I was seeing if my jacket was walking the sound. No, it's good. It's I think you're I think you're good. <laughs> um, so, but I see you're wearing a jacket down there in, in Florida today. No, no, I'm not in Florida. I'm at my family's house up in Virginia. Oh, and I'm cool. on. I they have this cute little screen porch that I can look outside at the um, leaves, at the trees that the leaves are falling off of, and I can smell the the fallen leaves. And it's a little bit of a rainy day. And I'm on their cute little porch and it's, it's a private area and it's not super cold, but it's cool enough for a Floridian to want a jacket. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, that makes sense then. That makes sense. So uh, that's another thing that I think is kind of cool about this book is that, uh, and in fact, I, I really hope too that transformative adventures as a thing continues to be collaborative like this and cooperative and produce some cooperative content. I feel like this book that we made is so much better than a thing that I would have made alone without you guys. Uh, and and uh, for people who don't know, we've been having, um, uh, you know, this started, the book started as classes a few years ago. So this book has been developing now for like uh, uh, three or four years officially. And, uh, and really in the last several months, we've been having weekly meetings talking about things and uh, I, I just, the book has grown in such interesting ways um, with, with, because of that multiple input. So I really love that collaborative way of, of working. And it's a good time to mention too, we're hoping to make it collaborative with anybody out there who wants to be doing this work of transforming their communities. Um, we actually will be announcing some ways that you can get involved in, uh, in, uh, like setting up a bookstore if you want or adding the book if you sell at your farmer's market and you can get the same commission on the book that uh, 
that anybody selling it that a bookstore would get, which is really good. And I think this is a pretty revolutionary kind of thing for us to be offering people. And uh, so we really want to start using all of the materials that we're making for transformative adventures. Some of them are going to be available for free, just for activists to promote in their own communities, or you can take it to your local bookstore and print it out. Uh, and uh, you can use it to help support yourself as an income stream too. So we really, I mean, we're really serious about this idea that we, we think we need a DIY green revolution or a green new deal. We need this green new deal thing. We need it now. We can't wait for politicians to do it. We've got to be the change. I, I just love, I just love the whole cooperative business thing because it's a way for us to store money with each other and minimize the amount of money that, that we have to store in banks or other kind of like distant financial instruments run by like distant centralized interests. I, I mean, I have this fantasy that we could actually just store all of our money with each other. Like it would be always kept in flow. And I'm not into like, oh, I'm going to stick it to the man. I want to take down the banks. I mean, that could end up being a, a byproduct. But what I'm into is supporting everybody, like supporting the people who are out there knowing what's really going on on this planet and really wanting to try to fix things together. And I think it'd be amazing if all of our money and, and labor was always in storage with each other in flow. Yeah, that's something we talk about in the in the book, too, um, is this concept of stocks and flows. And this is systems thinking. Um, there are some uh, one of the things I'm really proud of in the book is that uh, uh, we we say you know, d d this really came from the philosopher and systems thinker Danella Meadows. And uh, she wrote some uh, great books, great book called Systems Thinking and uh, and was involved in like systems thinking for activists and stuff like that. And uh, she says that you know, as a systems thinker, that usually we focus on brute force methods of changing our problems. So, for example, if you're out there and you have money problems, you're having trouble paying the bills. Uh, you know, you're trying to run a business and the business isn't going as well as you think it is. We often think. Well, what we need to do then is get more money in, make more money, right? And, and that's like solving the problem with brute force. Whereas she said, a lot of times we can solve problems by being more creative. And one of these things that we say, and well, the brute force method is get more money into the bank account, right? Store it in a stock, stock up on those dollar bills. <laughs> and a lot of times we do a lot of violence to try to stuff dollar bills into the stock instead of recognizing the value of energy that we, that is in the flows between us is kind of what Jenny is saying. So we could, this is a great idea that if all of you watching this are wealthier and have more resources and uh, more political capital to influence things, then Jenny and I are wealthier too, right? This is how it works. And if people in my community are wealthier, so this is a, one of the big ideas in the book is finding constructive ways that we can store money in each other <laughs> in those flows between us instead of stocks. Yeah. So Jenny, is there, uh, before we uh, take a few questions and then I, uh, and then I, I have a couple of things to give away. Uh, do you have a favorite part of the book that you'd like to mention? Is there, I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Yeah. You mentioned some of the tools in the book. Um, is there a particular tool yeah. that you'd like to mention? I have one. Yeah. My, my favorite tool is the one that I call uh, the tool for lazy people like me, which is reduce your need to earn. Like all of us, you know, a lot of us have certain unmovable fixed costs, like, students who are saddled with a lot of um, student debt or people who have medical debt. I mean, there's some things that can't be helped that we have to try to help each other grapple with, but A, we can help each other with those things by being in community together. And then B, there's a huge terrain of all these other areas of life that we can um, just reduce our fixed costs. Um, I like how Eric puts it. He says, if you're able to what is it? Crush, crush any of these categories. <laughs> one or more of these categories. Crush one or more of these categories. Housing. 
housing is pretty easy to crush. Um, the most easy, lazy way to do it is by sharing housing with other people. And there's just all different things. What's the other thing you can crush? You can crush your um, energy and transportation costs. There's lots of creative ways to, to crush those costs. So, and, and I like it because I found out in my life that it was not super strenuous, even with my little mixture of not traditionally lucrative works to make like maybe $10,000 a year or $12,000 a year or something. It's not, not too terrible to do that. But if I wanted to make $25,000 a year, I, I'd have to work like, I don't know, way harder than twice as hard. And it would end up, I'd be really stressed out and I wouldn't have time for all my cool projects. So I just, I just found it easier to cut my expenses way, way down and free up a bunch of time and energy. Yeah, and I I, uh, I love too that we were able to to show we you know, have a chapter on your example and on uh, on all of us we we contributed our own examples and talked very frankly about some of our finances and everything, and uh, we also have a lot of examples of other people too uh, who are doing these things and um, I I love that too and I one of the things that I love that you just mentioned was these categories. Um, that actually came out of like uh, U.S. Census data as far as what are the actual top categories that that are people's top expenses. Because a lot of times, this is, you were talking about how and this is the Pareto curve. This is a big systems thinking thing, right? As you can, I'm trying to draw. I'm tr tracing a curve on the screen here. I'm, I'll do it on both screens. I have two different screens. <laughs> and, <laughs> And uh, the uh, and the way that curve is is it's the law of diminishing returns, right? And so, it, like you were saying, what we've found is that it's it is pretty easy to get hammock income to work a handful of hours a week doing uh, back to the land kind of stuff, doing constructive stuff in your community, gardening, and be able to make around right about twelve grand, right? But then it just gets harder and harder and harder to make more money off of those sorts of sorts of income. So we have to think really creatively about it. And the same Pareto curve applies to saving money. So sometimes like we'll spend like this was me. I have a story in the book about how when uh, permaculture designer Peter Bain came to stay at my house, uh, he wrote the permaculture handbook, one of my favorite books. I love it. And, uh, and he came to do some workshops and he stayed at my house. And I had this big pile in a corner of, of uh, jars for canning and stuff like that, that I was trying to, uh, that I had collected. And they had turned into this giant monument in the corner. And uh, because I just could, I didn't have enough time to honestly clean all these things out. And yet I felt like somehow this would be saving me money if I did. And instead I had this big like, avalanche prone danger of of glass of stacked up and uh, and he told me you know it's okay to just recycle those <laughs> you know you have to figure out a place sometimes we have to cut our losses on the avalanche pile of of canning jars and you know and, and give them away if people want them or recycle them or whatever because you know i was trying i was spending a ton of time and effort to try to save a teensy weensy little bit of money. Right. And so when we start, and that's one of the, this tool of knowing what the big areas are for savings. Like you mentioned housing, it's right at the top because for a lot of people, it's 30% of your income. So if you can crush your housing expense, you just, you know, added 30% to your income. It's a huge potential savings. So, and, and then the transportation, mainly cars, and the food, food's big. Yeah. Oh, and I wanted to add a note about the mason jars. I actually <laughs> found out that when I optimized the number of mason jars that I kept, that they're lined up neatly in the cabinet with their lids. <laughs> um, and then the other ones, I go ahead and let them go and recycle. For me, I didn't see it as money savings. I saw it, I just hung on to them because I felt guilty. Like, oh, I screwed up. I bought this product that I wasn't able to buy in my own container. I was forced to take this additional container so now i will drag it along with me for the rest of my life as penance and so once I, once i got rid of of the horde of extra mason jars then i started to really utilize the ones i already had 
and, and I don't know, it just, uh, we do, I think we do maybe take things on our shoulder and then it ends up backfiring because we end up getting depressed and not being able to do as much. It's, it's so funny. It, it reminds me of the permaculture principle, uh, uh, the energetic principle that um, one of the Molson principles that a resource that doesn't go into productivity becomes pollution. And here I was hoarding mason jars. I was a mason jar hoarder. And, uh, and instead of becoming productivity, they became pollution in my kitchen. But once I optimized the number and I had then, you know, but it felt like I was throwing away money. I was throwing away a resource. So sometimes you got to do it. Yeah. Well, Jenny, uh, I would like to uh, see the, if anybody who's on has any questions uh, for Jenny about this book that uh, she helped us put together. I'm just really proud of uh, the, the thing that we Aww. put together here. So uh, if anyone has questions any, for any of us, for, questions what? about any anything or about a situation in your life or anything, anything. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like Denise has also uh, struggled with with hoarding containers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Denise. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, uh, same problem too, I guess. I, I really have a hard time throwing away even the jars that I get for food at the store. Like I have canning jars, but then I also have olive jars or whatever. And I'm just like, oh, I feel like I, ha I have to save this to keep beans in or to store herbs in. And it's just like, ah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it gets paralyzing. It, it does. It does get paralyzing. Interesting. Once I cleared a few of them away, I start. It started to help me think more clearly, and then I started to actually find ways to give them to other people. Like if I was giving soup to a neighbor, well, there it goes. Goes out in a mason jar, or this or that. Oh, and that's another thing I, I realized that it cuts across, what cuts across all the categories is our own kind of like emotional well-being and mental wellness and mental health. And we need to be able to um, take, ca take care and nurture our own mental health and navigate whatever kind of burdens that we're carrying, like whatever guilt or trauma. And it's really great that there are a lot of tools out there that, that are available for some people just physically working with our hands, it is a mental health tool. That is absolutely. And, and also just anything that allows us to sit and be present with what we're really feeling. And then the, the terrifying monster melts away. And I did find that the more a, more I did those things, the more I was able to navigate all the, all the categories and things straight. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny. Some of the, pre-readers and the reviewers who've read the book already um they said well, they didn't expect it to feel like a spiritual book and they said that this uh you know this but how can it not be like if you have a discussion of money and it's a serious discussion of money it should be a spiritual issue because otherwise it's destructive if you're not concerning yeah. money in the context of ethics and spirituality then you're you're probably doing it in destructive ways and um so like in the book, there's a, there's a section of patterns on, on, um, on dealing with, I can't remember how we worded this, but it came specifically out of one of the discussions that we had with you, Jenny, in, in one of our meetings, um, patterns on processing, um, like our dealing with our relatives and, um, and oh, I think I disappeared for a second. Uh, dealing with our relatives and like their their judgments on uh, on us accepting, you know, what they might think of as voluntary poverty lifestyles, or us putting aside, you know, not becoming finance bankers or whatever their uh, goal for us is. This can be a major barrier for a lot of us who want to live like simple lifestyles. It's just thinking about how our relatives are going to judge us or, or if that's going to cause a... So we actually have a whole chapter on dealing with that like a real zone zero zero issue. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mike, I was going to rejoin her about your comment about spirituality. I think the reverse is true too, that if, um, if we are working, if we're doing spiritual work and it bypasses the fact that we are bodies in the material plane 
then we're doing spiritual bypassing and then we're always going to keep colliding with the material plane because we're not really owning that we need to navigate it. And I don't know how to say that in a more practical way. Hopefully it transmits because I know a lot of what I would call spiritual people and I'm very metaphysical. I'm very into all that stuff. But once I started addressing the, the nuts and bolts, like, like in Zen, you know, you're physically chopping logs and carrying water and you're, knowing admiring the tea or you know you're physically rooted in the world in the earth and you're spiritual and and if we try it the other way like well i'm just just a spiritual being then i'm not going to seem grounded and i'm not going to be able to probably help or inspire very many people and i may will end up having some kind of financial issues and, and and struggles it's it's so true it's 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 all about that middle path right it's about that middle path and uh i i think i'm really proud that i think that's what we've laid out in the book and i think it's going to help a lot of people who want to to live that middle path so with that said uh my battery on one of my devices is apparently about to die soon so that means we have to wrap up (laughs) It's just good. It's it's perfect timing. It keeps us from boring people for too long. And <laughs> although I think this has been a good discussion. But uh, so if you joined and you want some free swag, uh, if you go to go, the, our website for the book is growingfree.money. I think that's hilarious. I crack myself up. <laughs> so <laughs> growingfree.money. And if you click on the book, there you'll find a link that will take you to where you can buy the book. And uh, uh, I could try to throw that. I'll try to throw that on the um, uh, on the Facebook pages and any kind of uh, place I can. So I'll try to throw that up. So if you go in there and you'll find a, um, uh, uh, I think it's called the Growing Free. It's called the excerpt book, or it's called the preview the preview if you see the preview ebook if you enter in the coupon code free ebook all caps free ebook then it'll send you a free preview of of the book and it's got a lot of the it's got a lot of good stuff in it so if you go there and enter in free ebook that'll get you there and then i have one other thing i've got probably one minute to get this in if you share uh, a link to the to the website and just say that you're interested in it. Share it on social media. Share it on Facebook for us. That's a way you can help uh, share some energy with us. Uh, then uh, the first five people who do that, I will send you a book or a, a coupon code to get the whole book to get growing free uh, to get an ebook version free. So that's kind of the thing, kind of a contest there. First five people share that. Tag me on it so I know it's you. And I will send you a code to get Growing Free free. And uh, so, yeah, if you have any questions about that, you can also send me a message. And we'll get that get that taken care of. And it's about all the time we got. So i got to say, Jenny, thank you so much for joining and ta- chatting about our book project. Thank you. Ev- thank you, everybody. And also, if you know about the Facebook group Transformative Adventure. Michael J's iPad disconnected. <laughs> oh, well, there, there we go. That's all we get for, um, for that. But for those still on uh, Facebook Live, the website, again, is growingfree.money. Growingfree.money. Share that. Tag me on it on, on any of your favorite social media. Um, and I'll send you um, uh, a link to get the ebook free for the first five people. So that's a, kind of a contest. you got to be got to race. Got to do it now. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, again for joining. Um, and I, I look forward to sending a few people. Um, if you're watching a recording of this, who knows? Some of those free ebooks might still be available. So it looks like there's about uh, 15 people have joined us uh, for this. Uh, between the two um, between the two platforms here. So uh, you have a pretty good chance of getting the book for free. And it's a huge book. It's like the size of the Permaculture Designer's Manual, all about, um, about creating financially resilient, excuse me, financially resilient and economically empowered lives. All right. 
Thank you, everybody, for joining the First Church of Permaculture. As always, um, it's been a pleasure. And I will now send us off with the world's first song, the world's the oldest song that we actually still have the notes and music for. And I think it's really appropriate to this topic of growing free as long as you live, live in love. Let nothing trouble you. Life is only too short, and time takes its toll. Thank you, everybody, for joining the First Church of Permaculture. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Bye. <laughs> Good. <laughs> gotcha, Denise. Good.